sort of fish the bream is. It hasn't the excitement of some other fishes, but it has its own special sort of charm, as much a charm of atmosphere as anything else. The waters in which you find the bream are usually of the slow or still sort, with muddy bottom and much growth of rushes at the margin. Just to look at the bream, you can see that it's not a very active and dashing sort of fish. It's very deep in the body, very narrow from side to side, with a bronzy tarnish over the silver. In fact, it's rather like an old pewter dish standing on edge. It feeds almost entirely on the bottom, and because it has this very deep shape with a small head, it tilts, and then it stands on its head to feed. When it feeds, grabbing in the bottom, it sends clouds of little bubbles up to break at the surface. The bream is essentially a shellfish, and bream shells may sometimes be enormous. Because the bream is such a heavy feeder, uh, the shoals move about a lot, browsing as they go, as they must if they have to continue feeding. Tackle for bream varies a lot from place to place. But there's no better rod than one of 11 feet, with plenty of action. As good a method as any is float fishing. And because the fishing is done in such placid water, you don't need too large a float, uh, except in some circumstances when this may be otherwise. But one that carries three BB shot is usually good in the majority of cases. The size of hook depends upon the bait. Baits are paste, maggot, worm, bread crust, bread flake, or it may be a number of other things. Now, where should we go to fish for bream? Well, uh, the northern part of Somerset has a great many waters holding bream. There are the rivers Brew and Parrot, and a number of man-made waters, such as the Huntsville River and the King's Edgemoor Drain. We're going to the North Drain. Lying in this flat, fenny, willowy part of Somerset, it's a peaceful, sluggish, placid sort of water where time seems to stop. But it breeds a great many fine fish, and among them are vast numbers of bream. There are two main ways you can set about finding bream. One is to search the water until you find a discoloration caused by the feeding of those hordes of slow, greedy bream grabbing in the bottom. The other way is by ground baiting, and for the best chance of success, you will need to do it each day for several days in advance, thus inducing the bream to congregate where they find a steady supply of food. This angler is Brian Young, and he has ground baited this swim for several days. With any sort of luck, he should find the bream here in the nice bream hole with a soft, oozy bottom. Brian Young has been using, and is continuing to use, a ground bait of stale bread, soaked, and then mashed up, mixed with sausage rusk. When it hits the water, it's firm enough to reach the bottom before it breaks up, and spreads do encourage the shells of bream into thinking that this is a good feeding place. He knows that the depth of water here is about five feet, so he adjusts his float about a foot and a half more than the depth of the water. That'll take the bait along the bottom, so that the bream will find it lying there, looking entirely natural and innocent. His rod, by the way, is a fiberglass one, 12 feet long. Brian is going to use maggots first, on a number 14 hook. Nice, lively maggots to catch the fish's eye in that still water. More ground bait before he casts.
sea, the Megat base on the end of the nylon, lies nicely along the bottom, away from the shot. And the float tilts nicely, a bit towards half cock. Now he settles down to wait. It's a slow, unhurried sort of fishing, at least to start with. The brim might, of course, start biting right away. But often you must wait for them to come on to the feed, ground baiting all the time, trying to encourage them. And when they do come on feed, uh, to this particular swim. As you know, most fishing needs patience, and fishing for bream has its own particular kind of patience. Brian's not worried that he's not yet had a bite. He knows that the fish are there. He must wait for them to start feeding and have confidence that, that eventually his ground baiting and his tactics will, will strike a fish and he will know that the shell is there and he'll carry on fishing for them. Meanwhile, he waits, ground baiting steadily, always on the alert for those bubbles on the surface that show that they're feeding. Hours have passed with no bite. They haven't come on feed yet. Brian brings in his bait for a check. More ground bait. He's decided to try a change of bait, worm, a nice, lively one, fresh from the moss. Cast out into that well ground baited water. The worm lies nicely along the bottom, cocking the float delicately as before, so that it will respond and indicate any interest the fish may be showing down there in the new bait. But he knows that it's still the amount of ground base and the time they will start feeding that he's dependent upon. Hello, bubbles breaking on the surface. The bream have begun to feed. Not near Brian's float yet, but they must eventually come now they're feeding to where there's most food. Watch that float. Yes, they're feeding the other fluid. There are the bubbles. The float's stirring. It's tilted.
It's sliding away. It's a bite. Brian strikes sideways, and he's got it. By the bend of the rod, it looks quite a reasonable fish. Turn the rod to raise the bream and draw it away from the shell, so as not to disturb the others. Bream isn't a very strenuous fighter. It's in the wooing and catching of him that the most of the fun comes. Here he is now, wallowing in the surface. carefully draws him towards the bank before sinking the landing net under him and bringing him ashore. Well, there he is, a good bream of about one and a half to two pounds. After taking out the hook, Brian puts him carefully into the keep net. I expect now he knows the bream are on feed, he'll settle down to see what he can do with the rest of the show. And as the evening draws in, we'll leave him there with our good wishes. There isn't a great deal of excitement in bream fishing, but what it lacks in that way, it makes up in other attractions. Mostly, I'd say that they were the atmosphere of it, its tranquility, and the quiet subtlety of the skills you must use in it. Uh, different sorts of fishing have different pleasures. Uh, in bream fishing, there isn't the strenuous excitement of pike fishing or salmon fishing, but it's very worthwhile for these other attractions it has. And what it lacks in excitement, it can very well make up in the numbers of fish taken. There may come a day when you happen upon a large shoal of bream, and you may take them one after another, even catching as many as a hundred weight, possibly. And I must say that, for myself, there is something in that, and I find the whole context of bream fishing very satisfying. This dreamlike tranquility, its context of quiet water and rushes, the calls of coot and moorhen, altogether a very satisfying and delightful pursuit, I find it. Well, goodbye for now, and I think we shall be going fishing again together soon. <laughs>
often bluish on the belly fins, and that lovely golden olive colour. And you see that lovely little eye with its ring of crimson round the centre. The whole fish, with its very tiny scales, looks as if it's smoothly varnished. Yes, a lovely fish, and a strong one. It likes to live where there's plenty of weed and a soft, muddy bottom. It's almost entirely a feeder on the bottom, and there's no more exciting sight to the angler than a cluster of oily bubbles coming breaking at the surface. It lives a very peaceful life, mostly in the slow or still waters. The fish for tench is the loveliest way to start a new course fishing season, and with many anglers it's a sort of ritual that first light on the 16th of June shall find them by a tench swim. All through those months of summer and early autumn, there are the tench browsing through the mud in the weed jungle. In most circumstances you need fairly heavy tackle for tench. This is a good rod, 11 feet long with a fair amount of action right down the rod. Now, you can float fish or you can leisure for tench, but there's no doubt it's far more fascinating to float fish. Uh, because you find tench in such still, quiet waters, you can use quite a small float, cocked by, say, three BB shot. Because the tench is found so often close to dense weed beds, you need a line of, say, six pounds breaking strain, Far more often than not, the most convenient reel to use is the fixed spool reel. Now, where's a good place to go for tench? Those quiet waters of the Fen district of North Somerset hold plenty of tench. Used to drain and reclaim this historic part of Western England, the man-made waters, drains and canals abound in this part of the country. The stillness of the waters, the weed growth, the thick beds of rushes make wonderful feeding grounds for tench. This is typical tench water, still or very slowly moving. Muddy but hemmed about with reeds and water plants, rich in the sort of food tench want. Tench that go grabbing on the bottom, sucking in the mud living their peaceful, lethargic lives, so much at variance with their behaviour when hooked. Even on this man-made canal, there's a beauty and a serenity on a late summer's day which makes tench fishing such a delight. Fred Thomas, with whom we're going to be today, knows these waters like the back of his hand, and after a few days' preparation, he's settling down to tench fishing. This water has been ground baited for several days in advance, with stale bread soaked and mashed and then dried off with meal. Fred continues the ground baiting before he starts fishing. There are various baits you can use for tench, and Fred has bread flake, paste, worms and maggot. He's going to try bread flake first. Something pinched from a crumb of a new loaf, rather gluey preferably, pressed onto a number 12 hook. He's using a 12-foot fiberglass rod, by the way. Uh, Fred is adjusting his float to present the bait a foot and a half deeper than the water, uh, because tench is so confirmed a bottom feeder that the bait must be presented greater than the depth of the water, so as it lies along the bottom. Now he casts. The bait going to the bottom and the frilly edges to flake away among the ground baiting. The bait lies right on the bottom, about 18 inches from the short length of the cast, the shot just off the bottom cocking the float. And there it is, a little at half cock in the still water, a very peaceful sight, a deeply fascinating sight. And there it may stay perhaps for hours, with no more disturbance, except for the constant throwing in of ground bait to keep that swim full of enticement. Because tench are not to be interested generally by small amounts of ground bait. There must be plenty of it something to hold them in this one particular place, away from all the rest of this fat, soft canal, which is so full of food for such fish as tench are.
and Fred Waits, seemingly patient, but really full of expectancy, lost in the summer world of the fisherman. He's really waiting for those bubbles to appear, to show that the tents are on feed. When it's on feed, it must go to Fred's deeply ground-baited, temptingly attractive swim. An hour's passed and the fish haven't come on yet. That's the way with tench. But Fred, who is a tench fisherman, isn't in the least bit worried. It's a lovely day and this combination of peace and tranquility with a constant expectancy is the character of the fishing which appeals to him. But he's decided to try a change of bait. See if they'll take worm today. A good worm kept in moss so that it's fresh and lively. Put on the same hook, the number 12. Fred casts out across into his well ground baited swim. The worm lies on the bottom, well out from the cast, and the shot holding it so that it cocks the float nicely. Let's see if the tench will take the change of bait. Fred's still looking for that certain sign, bubbles, which show that the tench are feeding. Even the bite will be characteristic. After the first tentative mouthings, there will be a slow sliding away of the float as the tench takes the bait. Hello, they are the bubbles. The tench are beginning to feed. This is an exciting time for the angler, for they must soon come near to where Fred has ground baited the swim. No, they are not around this float yet. Now they're there. They're feeding their Fred's float. It can happen at any moment now. Something's happening to that float. Yes. Fred strikes. No doubt there's a fish on. Though it's so peaceful a fish, the tench is a powerful fighter when hooked. Yes. 
Yes, that's characteristic. He's gone deep and straight for the weeds. Fred stopped it by turning over the rosin, and putting on side strain. Yes, he, he's got him away from these weeds on the far bank. He's recovering line now. Now the clinch is off again, back to the weeds. But not as far this time. Tiring a little now, but it's still strong. Can't you always go deep? Near the rod now. Yes, it's really tiring. It's coming close to the surface. Fred's playing it carefully. With any kind of fish, this can be a most dangerous time. Sink the net deep in the water. Draw the fish over and lift. And here's that lovely, glistening, buttery tench. Just one of a show that now should be feeding in that well-prepared swim. The afternoon is now drawing towards the evening of a lovely late summer's day. So we'll leave Fred still fishing, because he'll go on well into the night. There's no doubt that the tench has its own very particular magic. You find it in such lovely, soft, summery places. And it's such a drowsing, lazy-seeming sort of fish. But when it's, when it's hooked, it gives such tremendous excitement. Uh, to the coarse fishermen, there is the whole essence of what summer fishing means in the tench. A summer season without tench wouldn't be a season at all. Well, let's go fishing again soon. Goodbye until then. sort of fish. It's quite a modest fish, going its way, mostly close to the bottom, finding its food there. Its silvery scales reflect its surroundings, helping to camouflage it. And that's as well, because it's a timid, inoffensive, hunted fish, hunted by such enemies as the pike. That may be a reason for it's always swimming in shoals. And it's also the reason why the roach is such a shy, subtle fish, hard to catch when it's grown big and experienced. Small roach can be easy enough to catch. There are a great many waters, small farm ponds, canals, there are many such places that swarm with little roach that are very innocent, give themselves up very easily. And there's many a fishing career has been started when a small boy has gone there with his primitive tackle and his worm and has caught these little fish easily enough. Little fish, but enough to thrill him and make him a lifelong angler. There are more roach under a pound than over. In fact, I'd say that a majority of fishermen 
hardly ever see a half pound roach. But for all of them, there's an impassioned lifelong quest to catch a roach that weighs two pounds. For most of them, it's never realized. Because the roach is a small fish, not a very strong fish, the tackle for it doesn't need to be strong. Uh, and this is a great advantage, because if there's to be much chance of catching a roach, this very shy, cautious, cautious fish, uh, tackle needs to be light to overcome the fish's suspicions. At least that's so in the majority of cases. There are waters where uh, the roach are not much fished for, where the tackle may be relatively coarse, lettered on the bottom, perhaps, with a log worm, but this is most untypical. Now, what tackle to use for these roach? Well, here's the rod, 12 feet long, with a fair amount of action, because that action absorbs the shock on the fine line which must be used. The line, most typically, two pounds breaking strain, very fine. There are waters where it can be quite a lot heavier, where there's a heavy current, but there, it's not the strength of the fish which is dictating the strength of the line, it, it's the weight of the current. Now, with that line, quite a small float, to carry, say, three BB shot, and the hook, well, the hook is quite small. And number 12, you see, we should be using small baits, and that gives us the chance to use this quite small hook, and so keep everything in the same scale of lightness, fineness, as small as we can get it with safety, so as not to go against the shyness and caution of these roach. Now, where to go for roach? Well, there are a few better roach rivers than the Kennet in the southern English county of Berkshire. And here we are on the Kennet on a day early in the year, a crisp till morning with no sounds but those of birds and water. The tranquil stretches that run between the rushy banks offer, as well as lovely scenery, good sport to the quiet roach fishermen. I'm looking for one of those nice roachy looking glides that are so exciting to the angler. Bearing in mind the timidity of the roach and the need not to upset the show, I settle down very quietly and cautiously. I think I found a good swim. A nice gliding swim down to the inside bend on the bank. Bound to be roached there. got a nice gravel bottom with plenty of weed growth on either side, just what roach like. To get the roach ready to take my bait, I must use the right ground bait. This is soaked and mashed bread dried off with meal. I squeeze up a small ball of it so that it sinks and breaks up nice and small on the bottom so that it will trickle down through the swim. Now what bait? Bread crust takes an awful lot of beating for big roach. There are other baits which do well for roach, like maggots, worms, bread, flake, but we'll use crust. Now I cast to the top of the swim. The float cocks prettily, just the tip showing. I've guessed the depth of six feet. Ah, the float's dragging under. It's snagging the bottom. It needs to be set down a bit, I think.
That's right. Now the bait will be just tripping the bottom. Now we must watch that float like a hawk. Roach bites are sometimes very subtle. See, I'm very careful not to jerk the float, letting it swim down freely, naturally, and I must keep closely in touch with it. No loose line between rod and float. When the current puts a belly in the line, I must get it out, or I might miss a bite if it comes. The end of the swim, and judging by the rumpling of the surface, the gravel banks up there. Fish often wait in such places. So I clamp my finger on the reel, the float halts, and the bait rides up from the bottom and wavers. That often brings a bite. Not this time. Bring the tackle back and try another swim down. Throw in some more ground bed. Must keep the fish interested in this diet. Have them looking for the extra big fragment that's on my hook. A lot of the natural food doesn't stay on the bottom, it lifts and wavers, and that's what I'm hoping the ground bait is doing as it goes downstream through the swim, keeping the fish curious. You remember what I did on that first swim down, at the end of the swim, when we stopped on the gravel slope. I halted the reel and held the float so that the bait stopped and hovered. Well, I'm going to do that all the way down some this time. First some more ground bait. Then another cast. Let it swim down a few feet. And stop the reel with my finger. The float stops so that the bait lifts and wavers. Now a few feet further, and the same again. Stop the float, and the bait lifts and wavers. It's called strip pegging. It can be deadly in tempting roach. I do it all the way down the swim. Nearly at the bottom of the swim. Ah, there's a bite. And he's on. Good fish by the feel of it. Let the bend of the rod take the strain and steer the fish out of the swim as soon as possible, with the least disturbance to the rest of the show. First plunges over, starts to gain some line. Ah, there he goes again. Let's let him take a little line. Now, gently, hold on, on the bend of the rod. Now, he's giving a bit. Got him out of the swim, gaining line now. Mustn't play him too hard, though. I don't want him splashing on the surface close to the swim. I don't want to scare the rest of the show. Tiring now, start bringing him in. Landing net ready. Many a good fish is lost at the landing net. You have to be quiet and gentle about it. Quite a nice fish. Certainly a pound. Might be more. And plenty of others where he comes from. Well, you've seen something of a good day's fishing. 
I don't know what it is about the road. I brought everything from them to Giant Shark. Yet I still feel the same fascination of the roach. Certainly isn't their size, certainly isn't their strength, as you see, and they haven't very much of either. I think possibly it's something to do with their very wide distribution. You find them in every sort of water, from small canals to fast rivers like the Hemp's Raven. Uh, and in all these cases, they might be different fish. Suppose you're fishing on a North Country canal. Well, there you'll be using tiny hooks and tiny baits compared with which the bait you've seen me using is vast. And then at the other extreme, there's the Hampshire Haven, a very fast, heavy river. And there you'll be trotting down long distances, hooking your fish 40, 50 and more yards away, and using a line of five pounds breaking strain even. You'll be using a heavy strike and very big baits relatively. The fishing there might be for a different fish. It's as different as you might almost say, fishing for bream and, and fishing for salmon. Take the Norfolk Broads. Uh, there are a great many roach in Norfolk Broads. And I should say that most of them are from half a pound to three quarters of a pound. And therefore, there you can fish for them with relatively coarse tackle. But if you go for roach on a canal I know, for example, in Cheshire, there the fishermen use minute hooks, hair fine lines, tiny baits. But I know a fisherman even there who uses a relatively coarse line and hook, a big lobworm for bait lying on the bottom. He doesn't catch many roach, but when he does, they're very big roach. Yes, it's the variety of roach, which is so very much part of the fun. It's the infinite variety of problems, which is so very fascinating. But having said that, I realise that that still leaves the inner heart of the fascination untouched. I never yet met a roach fisherman who could say exactly where it lay. And I'm sure I can't. There are other fish the same size, or approximately the same size, that are enjoyable to fish for, but they haven't quite the same satisfaction. Well, I shall look forward to the next day's fishing. See you soon. Chubb gives at least one advantage to the angler. He's a greedy fish. There are few things he won't eat and few times he won't eat them. At the same time, he's a cautious, suspicious fish, able to detect you by the least awkward movement. You'd swear he could see round trees. He's very much a show fish. You find shows of them from about a pound up to three or four pounds lurking in the easy water of rivers. When they get beyond that weight, they tend to become solitary. And then they can grow up to as much as ten pounds. Chubb love to lie close to and, and among tree roots that go down into the water. And the first thing they do when you hook them is to make a powerful dive for those roots to break your tackle. That's when you must hold them firmly. So you need pretty strong tackle. Uh, this is the sort of rod for Chubb. Uh, plenty of bend with a strong action right the way down so that it's good for absorbing the first plunge of the Chubb. And the line must match. But one that might play a chub perfectly well in the open water is no good among the roots. So, nylon, a six pounds breaking strain. There are plenty of rivers that hold chub, uh, but let's go for a big chub today. There's one river better than any other for big chub. The River Avon in the beautiful English southern county of Hampshire. There's no slow water on this river. It's fast and gin clear. Not an easy river to fish, 
because that canny fish, the chub, can detect you a long way off. We're fishing with Leslie Brewer today. He knows his chub. He knows how to get them on this river. There's no slow water, but Leslie must look for some of the steadier water, preferably a nice gliding swim under trees. He's going for that swim, and as it's some 30 yards away, he's going to fish from the punt. Probably a great shell of chub down there, waiting for what falls off the trees and what comes down with the current. Caterpillars, insects, worms, grubs, fallen fruit, small fish, slugs, snails. I've even seen them grab cigarette ends. Leslie's going to use ground bait heavily. It's a good thing with chub to make them think that nature has started sending them plenty of what you're going to offer them eventually on the hook. Mashed bread mixed with sausage rusk as big as an orange and squeezed dry so that they'll sink well. And cheese in each ball because that's what he's going to use on the, as a bait. This ground bait breaks up gently and floats downstream. Remember, Leslie's fishing a long way off, so the ground bait must travel and there must be plenty of it. Leslie Brewer's using on his chub rod a nylon line of six pounds breaking strain with a big float for the very strong current and to carry the amount of lead necessary to get the bait down to the fish. His bait is mashed bread with cheese in it. Leslie's going to make a test cast to find the depth. He's well away from where he thinks the chub are, so he's made his cast into the strong current to take the line off the reel against gentle finger pressure. Let's suppose that the swim's seven feet deep. There's no need to have the bait right against the bottom because chub find their food at all levels in the water. Ah, floats dragged under, bait snagging the bottom. Bring it back for readjustment. He puts the float down about four inches so that there will be a trail of nylon from the lead to the hook going ahead of the lead parallel with the bottom. A couple more balls of ground bait so that they'll reach bottom near the head of the swim and break up down the swim. Must have these chub expecting what's on the hook. Cast again. Allowing the bait to move naturally with the current all the way down the swim. There's usually no doubt about it when the chub takes the bait but those chub are a long way off down there, and at that distance the strike has to be a powerful sweeping one to take up all that line and set the hook six feet below the surface. You can easily miss on the strike by having loose bellows of line between you and the fish. That's why Leslie's correcting the bellows of line as the current puts them in. That's about the end of the swim the tackle's got to, where he expects the chub to be. He can only just see the float, so bring it back for another cast. Bait all right? Yes. Pour 
source of smoke. <laughs> well, that means the fight's on. Leslie's convinced that under that bush the chub are lurking and he's determined to catch one or more. More ground baits with cheese inside the balls. Must have these chubs expecting and looking for cheese. Mind you, mustn't expect the chub to come too quickly to the bait. Don't forget how suspicious they are. They've got to get used to the ground bait. Rebait. Again down that swim. The float nicely riding down the current. Leslie watching it like a hawk every inch of the way. Getting near the end of the swim now. That ground bait ought to be taking effect. So Leslie tries holding the tackle to make the bait ride up. Tease the fish with it. No, oh, those cautious, canny chub. A strike, a typical chub bite. Hope Leslie can hold him from those roots. Lord, how he's pulling. But Leslie must risk a break. Side strain helps pull the fish off balance. Ah, uh, he's beginning to yield a bit. Now hustle him before he can recover. Get him out. You get the advantage of a chub in the open water. They pull like the devil near their hulks, but soon give up when they're in the open water. Now he's coming. Wind him up fast when he's coming towards you. Now he's off again. But Leslie doesn't let him get all the way back to those roots. That one's over. Soon have him now. Not a bad fish. Ready with the net. Draw him over it. Good. Lift. And there he is. A lovely chub. Three pounds of him anyway. Could be near a four. And that need be only the beginning. Leslie should be able to catch two or three more before disturbing the show and having to move on to another swim. Some men live for chub fishing, but some others, particularly fly fishermen, regard the chub as, well, vermin. Now, we've been fishing today with Leslie Brewer, who is well known on the Hampshire Avon as a trout and salmon fisherman. Now, Leslie, you as a trout and salmon fisherman, do you look at the chub as vermin? Great as no. Uh, I've no date on a pucket trait stream. It would be regarded uh, so but not on a river like the Avon, with its great variety of fish. It's then just a, another quarry for you to angle for in your day's fishing. But, Leslie, when you've been accustomed to the fierce fight of the trout and the thrilling runs of the salmon, don't you find the chub, well, a, a bit tame? Oh, no. It, it's just another form of angling. After all, you can flog the water all day for salmon, tire yourself out, and you achieve nothing until you actually hook the salmon. But chub fishing has interest all the time. But, 
Leslie, it's often said that there's a fineness and an aristocracy about the trout and salmon, and that therefore it demands a finer skill. Oh, nonsense. If I had to decide which were the most skillful angler, I would certainly choose the Nottingham style angler, particularly one that can cast direct from the reel. I'd agree with that. Uh, there's a, a skill in all types of angling. It doesn't really matter what it is. You just get your, your pleasure from your own particular skill or amount of skill, and, and that makes your day's fishing. Uh, Leslie, it seems to me there's still something that sends you chub fishing. We've talked of the fight. Uh, we've talked of the skill you use. But there must be something else that makes of you a fisherman. A fisherman for such a fish as chub. Uh, tell me what it is. Well, I don't know, Bernard. Uh, I suppose the answer is I just like fishing. <laughs> well, you've heard Leslie put his case, and I'm bound to say it goes for me too. And indeed, I hope it's true for all fishermen. Fishing's made up of a great many things, and you can't isolate any one of them. If we were able to, it would probably destroy the delight of fishing. Well, see you again soon. Now, Leslie, um, I was thinking about those ropes at the top of...